Good morning, everybody. Uh, we're going to get started here in just a few moments. I wanted to ask if there's any room, say if you're on these outside uh, sections, if you can move toward the inside, um, toward the middle that is. And if you're in this middle section, if there's any room for you, if you could move just to one side or the other, that would be very helpful. We still have a lot of folks coming in and we're excited about that. We want to worship all together in this room. So if you could do that for us, that would be much appreciated. Thank you.
If you haven't already heard, our Greater Capital Campaign is launching in April. The purpose of this campaign is to raise the necessary funds to build a multi-purpose or gym building. We encourage you to begin praying now about how you can contribute. We have an exciting event coming up for dads and daughters. Saturday, April 6th, we will be hosting a father-daughter sweetheart banquet in the Fellowship Hall from 6 to 8 p.m. This is an opportunity for girls, birth through sixth grade, and their dads to dress up, have a meal, and enjoy a fun night together. If you would like to participate in this free event, please sign up on the website or through the app. On Saturday, April 13th, our men's ministry will be hanging out at Tom Bigby State Park, planned to be at the main pavilion at 8.30 a.m. There will be field games, cycling, and disc golf. Lunch will be provided with a worship time to wrap up the day. Sign up on the website or through the app. Our women's ministry is hosting a Tablescapes event for all ladies on Saturday, April 20th from 5 to 7 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. The theme is Living in Christ. If you would like to participate either by hosting a table or simply by attending, please sign up through our website or app. Vacation Bible School will be June 9th through 13th from 5.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. We need lots of help to make this week possible for kids in our community. Please sign up to volunteer on our website or through the app. Good morning, everybody. My name is Corey Jeffcoat, and I am the youth pastor here at First Baptist. And I want to be the first one, if nobody has said it yet, happy Easter. Aren't we glad that today is the day we're able to celebrate Jesus' resurrection? I expected like a, a applause or something, but <laughs> silence. Um, I guess nobody's excited about Jesus raising from the dead. But um, today is Easter, and today is the reason why we're able to celebrate Christianity as a whole is because Jesus is risen. And if today is your first time visiting with us, I would like to say welcome. I'm so glad that you chose to worship with us this morning. I know there's a ton of different churches around the area that you could have worshiped at, but you chose us. And we do not take that lightly. If you see an orange connect card in front of you, please fill out as much or as little information as you would like and give it to somebody at the first time table, and we will present you a gift for just being here and visiting with us today. Because again, we do not take that lightly. And today is an awesome day. We got a whole bunch of beautiful faces behind me, and I know they are ready to worship King Jesus with us today. So I'm gonna pray, and then we'll get started with worship. Lord, just thank you for this day. Lord, thank you again for allowing your son to die a cruel death so that we could be made free. And Lord, help for us not to forget that. Help for us to hold on to what this day means the rest of the year. Lord, help for it not to be a one-day event, but help for it to be an event that changes our outlook on life. Lord, and Lord, just continue to be with us. Continue to help for our worship be pleasing to you. Lord, in your holy name, Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you. 
is the story of Easter. God so loved the world that he sent his only son so even kids like us could live forever. Jesus was born in Bethlehem and he grew up in a town called Nazareth. He was only 12 years old. His parents found him in the temple with the teachers. He was the one teaching them. As he got older, he began to do the work of his father in heaven. He ministered to the sick and hurting, but he never forgot a kiss like us. The more miracles Jesus performed, the more people began to talk about him. They knew there was something very special about him, and everywhere he went, there were lots of people waiting to see him. This journey he was on took him to Jerusalem. He was riding on a donkey. People were waving branches from palm trees. They had waited for a king, and now he had come. They shouted praise to the king who comes in the name of the Lord.
comrade and praising him, who even tried to trap Jesus. Some even made plans to get rid of him, but Jesus knew it was all a part of God's plan. He was arrested in Paul trail. The same people who had this called him king a few days earlier. Now we are calling him to be crucified. The soldiers took Jesus to a place called Golgotha and nailed him to a cross. But even then, Jesus forgave the ones who did terrible things to him. They took Jesus' body and laid him in a tomb and put a big stone in front of it so no one could take him. Early on the third day, some ladies went to the tomb, but the stone was rolled away. They went inside and an angel said, Why are you looking for Jesus? He is not here. He is risen from the dead. Everything changed that morning came for kids like us. Because Jesus was raised to life, we can raise a hallelujah. The King is alive and is our living God.
Well, good morning. Uh, What a fabulous time uh, we've had already on Easter Sunday as we've been lifting up the name of Jesus. Man, our kiddos did great. Don't you agree? Choir, worship team, fantastic. Uh, What better way uh, to, to usher in our time in the Word this morning as we celebrate Jesus who is alive. Amen. You with me? Sound good? All right, I like it. I got one amen. I appreciate that. All right, thank you for that. Hey, listen, I recently heard about a girl named Alice who had bought a parrot from the pet store. Uh, But when Alice took the parrot home, it wouldn't talk. So several days, Alice did what she could to try to figure out why the parrot was not talking until she went back to the pet store and told the owner of the store what her problem was. So the pet store owner said, you know what, how about you buy a ladder for the cage and let's see if that warms the parrot up a little bit to you. So Alice bought a ladder, went back home, put it in the cage. A few more days passed, the parrot still wouldn't talk. So Alice went back to the pet store, said the same thing. Uh, Store owner, I tried, I did what you asked me to do, and the parrot is still not talking. So the owner of the store then said, well, a ladder was a good try, let's also try a swing. So Alice uh, bought the swing, went back home, put it in the cage with the parrot, Swing still didn't work. So a couple days later, Alice goes back to the pet store, says the same thing. And so Alice tried several other items. She got the bird a a mirror. She got it a miniature plastic tree. She got some other shiny parrot uh, toys. And still, nothing would work. Several days passed when Alice went back to the pet store. And this time, the owner found Alice with tears in her eyes, waiting outside the store to open. Her parrot was dead. The store owner asked Alice if if the parrot had ever said anything. And Alice said, well, yes. Right before the bird died, it looked up at her and said, does the pet store have any food? (laughs) Now, listen, I tell you that silly story only because I want you to think about a simple question with me this morning. Here's the question. How often do we forget about what's most important? I'm going to say it to you again. How often do we forget about what's most important. You see, most holiday seasons are the same. We get a break from school or from work, awesome. We get to see family, spend some time together, awesome. We get to eat, awesome, right? And listen, we get to celebrate. Sometimes that's with gifts, maybe it's with candy, maybe it's new outfits. Listen, all of these things are good. In fact, my family does all these things too. I'm wearing a brand new shirt today. I had the Easter Bunny already come by my house. So listen, I've already been down this road as well. All these things 
are good. But listen, we're not here today because of a bunny or because of a break from uh, normal life or even because of family, even though none of those are bad. You see, sometimes, just like Alice with her parrot, we can get caught up in so many other things that we forget about the most important reason for today. We forget about what Jesus has done for us. And our never-ending desire to move forward and make sure that everything we do, everything we say, everything we think is relevant to modern living, too many of us have stopped concentrating on the wonders of Jesus crucified. Listen, that's what I want us to think about this morning. I want us to take a few minutes today and remember those final moments of Jesus' life. I want us to remember what's most important as we celebrate Easter, as we celebrate Resurrection Sunday together. Listen, when we get to those final hours of Jesus' life, he takes his disciples and he celebrates the Passover meal with them. This Passover meal would be different from any of the other ones before. Those disciples had spent years celebrating the freedom of God's people from the hands of the Egyptians. Jesus himself had spent plenty of years celebrating the Passover. They knew the practice. They knew the intricate details of the ceremony. They knew why they did everything that they did. Yet, as they're remembering what God did back in the Exodus, Jesus reveals to them that he's the ultimate Passover lamb. His body would be broken. His blood would be poured out so that the sins of the world could be forgiven. Those disciples would remember how a perfect spotless lamb was killed and its blood applied to the doorpost of each house so that the judgment of God would pass over that house. So Jesus, too, would be killed. And anyone who applies his blood to their lives will have the judgment of God pass over them because of the sacrifice of Jesus. You see, in those early moments before uh, Jesus would be betrayed and arrested and put on trial and crucified, Jesus, in those moments with his disciples, was looking ahead at what was to come. He was looking ahead at what was most important. Listen, as I reflected this past week over those final days of the life of Jesus, there were three particular things that stood out to me that became of utmost importance. I want to show them to you this morning. Here's the first one. There was a decision to be made. There was a decision to be made. You say, Danny, what do you mean? Well, in Luke's gospel, chapter number 22, verse 39, Luke writes for us about a very serious moment that Jesus has as he's praying at the Mount of Olives. Here's what Luke wrote, Luke 22, verse 39. And he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. By the way, this was his custom means that Jesus oftentimes spent time alone with God seeking whatever it was that he wanted for him. This is not the first occasion that Jesus spends some time asking what God wants him to do with his life. Jesus often, as was his custom, spent time with God. And so there he was, disciples with him. Luke goes on to write, and when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. What was he talking about? He's talking about the crucifixion that is to come. He's talking about the suffering that he will go through for the sins of the world. He knows how difficult the road is ahead. And so he says, God, if there's any other way. But then he says, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Now, I know if you're like me, this moment is extremely hard to imagine. The weight of what Jesus would have to do, the suffering that he would endure, the sacrifice that he would have to become, like, wow, it's hard to fathom the weight that Jesus is carrying in this moment. Listen, he had plenty of comfort. You said, Andy, what do you mean? He had his disciples praying at his side, even though from time to time they fell asleep, right? But they're there, they're with him. 
He had an angel from heaven providing him with strength. He had comfort. He had compassion. He loved people over and over again throughout the life of Jesus. We find him showing love and mercy and compassion upon people, whether he was healing the sick or casting out demons or simply correcting his own followers. He was always filled with compassion. There's no doubt that he wanted to free us from sin. He also had commitment. Listen, clearly he wanted to do what God wanted. This is why Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. We know all throughout his life, Jesus was always about the Father's business. Yet, Jesus was in agony. None of us forget the words that Luke wrote. His sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. Now listen, I don't know if Luke's literally describing a medical condition of sweating drops of blood or if he's just describing the extreme stress that Jesus is experiencing in these moments. Either way, I don't know, but here's the point. Jesus is struggling with the hardest decision that anyone would ever have to make. This is why Luke writes, he prayed more earnestly. Listen, the word earnestly literally means to stretch out or to extend. It's as if every part of Jesus was being stretched to the breaking point. He's begging God if there's any other way. He is being stretched beyond what we can imagine. However, Jesus knew, God knew, there was no other way. Jesus had to make the hardest decision anyone would ever make. He decided to lay down his perfect, sinless life for sinners like you and like me. There was a decision to be made. Can I show you something else, though? There was a debt to be met. Absolutely, there was a debt to be met. Maybe you're Wondering again, Danny, what are you talking about? Well, listen, we know why his sweat became like great drops of blood. Because the debt he would pay on the cross for you and for me is well beyond our comprehension. Jesus is betrayed by one of his own. He's arrested. He's denied and abandoned by those closest to him, even those who said they never would. He's mocked. He's put on trial. He's found guilty of crimes that he never committed, and then he's given up to be crucified. Luke gives us a picture of this scene in Luke 23, verse 33. Look at it with me. It says, and when they came to the place that is called the skull, right? If that doesn't give you chills, I don't know what will. There they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. In fact, one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him saying, Do do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence and condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. That's the greatest picture of the cross. All of us are like those criminals. Jesus did nothing wrong. He's on the cross for our sins. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Now it was about the sixth hour and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour while the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus calling out with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. 
Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home, beating their breasts. Why? They knew the wrong they had done. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. Listen, I'm reading these verses and my mind went to the mockery that's taking place. Listen, it's unimaginable the amount of mockery thrown at Jesus. He never did anything wrong. He only loved. He only helped people. I instantly went to the mercy. How can Jesus still continue to love and forgive? How can he continue to want the best for those who are literally torturing him? He even asked God to forgive them. He even forgives one of the criminals that's on the cross with him. Friends, he He died. He died on that cross for you and me, even though he knew every bad, disgusting, sinful thing about each of us. I think about the mission, as Jesus has already told us back in Luke 19, 10, that he came to seek and to save the lost. I think about so much happening in these verses as Jesus has died for the sins of the world. But can I tell you something? There's really one phrase that I could not get away from as I was reading in Luke chapter 23. It comes in verse number 49. Let me read it to you again. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee, look at this, stood at a distance watching these things. That phrase continued to to resonate in my mind, at a distance. You say, Danny, why? Because this is how all of us can be described. That's what sin has done. It's created a great distance between us and God. And no matter how good you are, no matter how hard we try, no matter what family you come from, the debt we owe could never be met by us. We could never pay what we owed. Matter of fact, you can go all the way back to when God created the world and you see those first two humans, Adam and Eve, choosing to disobey God. And because of their decision, the Bible tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Because of their decision, every person, yes, you and me, have been born into this world into sin. And listen, because we're sinners, the Bible is clear about the debt that we owe. Here's what the Bible tells us, for the wages or the debt of sin is death. You know what that means? It means the cross that Jesus died on, it was really meant for you and for me. We're the ones who deserved to make that payment. We're the ones who deserve death because of our sin. Yet God made a way for our sin debt to be paid by someone else. The Bible says the wages of sin, the debt of sin is death, but The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. God gave us a gift through Jesus. The sin debt still had to be paid. God's wrath had to be justified. Someone has to die for sin. Friend, listen to me. It can be you, it can be me, or we can trust in Jesus' death on the cross in our place. Apostle Paul put it best in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 when he wrote these words. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Friend, can I tell you something? God knew we could never live up to his standards. We could never live a perfect life to deal with the distance that sin has placed between us and him. So God made a way through Jesus. Paul says he knew no sin. You know what he's referring to? Jesus lived a perfect, sinless life, and he's the only one who could be made a sacrifice for our sins. We couldn't live a perfect, sinless life, but Jesus could. He knew no sin. And because he was the perfect, sinless sacrifice, for our sake, he made him to be sin. Do you realize the agony now in that garden as Jesus is praying? Do you realize why there's sweat droplets of blood coming off of him? Because he knew he would have to take on the entire sin of the world. He made him to be sin for us. Jesus became the offering of our sin. He paid the debt we could never pay so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus not only paid our debt, but he gives us new life. Imagine this for a moment. 
Imagine you go to the bank and they say, why are you paying any more on your house? Somebody's already cleared all that debt for you. And you're like, what? I ain't got to make house payments anymore. That's awesome. Debt has been paid. How many of you would like that? Raise your hand real quick. Yeah, me too, right? Now imagine, take it a step further. Imagine that not only has your debt been cleared, but there's millions of dollars in your bank account. Not only is all the debt of your past gone, but everything you will ever need provision for in the future has been paid. Friends, that's Jesus on the cross. He did that for you and for me. There's an old story told about a hot, dry day in the Old West. There was a train that was roaring down the tracks and sparks were flying everywhere. And because it was so hot, it started a fire. This wasn't an ordinary fire, though. This was a terrible fire. It destroyed so many ranches, so many homes, so many livestock. And it's told that an old farmer who owned some property that was destroyed was walking through the ashes of his house and his ranch, and he saw one of his hens lying on the ground, wings spread open, burnt to death. In his anger and frustration over all that happened, he kicked the dead hen. And to his surprise, several baby chicks ran out from under her burnt wings. You see, when the fire came, the hen draped herself over her little ones and took the fire to save their lives. Do you get the image? Infinitely more than this story is what Jesus did for us on the cross. When the fire of God's holy wrath should have consumed us, Christ spread out his arms on the cross and he covered us in his blood. This is Jesus. There was a decision to be made. There was a debt to be met. Can I show you one more thing real quick? There was a deliverance to be manifested. I love this moment. This is where it's beautiful. This is what we celebrate today. Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world. He made the decision to pay the debt that we could never pay. And then his body was laid in a tomb with a stone rolled in front, and that was the end. No, of course not, right? We know that what the devil thought was victory, what the devil thought was the end, was really just the beginning. Jesus was just getting started. Luke 24, in the very beginning of the chapter, he lets us in on the most glorious moment in all of history. Here's what he writes. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking the spices that they had prepared and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. How could it be? Who would move such a mighty stone? And when they walked Went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And so while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Hallelujah. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee. Friends, is this not beautiful? Victory had been won. Mission accomplished. These men, these angels reminded them of what Jesus had told them. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, but has risen. Sin is defeated. Death is no more. The grave has no power. This is why Paul would write, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? It's been conquered by the resurrected Lord, Jesus our Savior. Listen, I don't know if you've heard about the old legend. It's about a boy by the name of Philip and his Sunday school class. Philip was an 11-year-old boy with Down syndrome who attended a Sunday school class with eight other children. The legend goes that on Easter Sunday, his teacher brought an empty plastic egg for each child in her class. They were instructed to go outside and fill their egg with something that reminded them of the meaning of Easter. After all the kids came back, each egg was opened, and the children were so excited. You know, one showed a butterfly, another a twig, another a flower, another a a blade of uh, uh, grass, all things that reminded the children of Easter until finally the last egg was opened. It was Philip's egg, but it was empty. So all the children began to laugh and make fun of Philip. Clearly, he didn't understand the assignment. He didn't understand what the teacher was telling them. And as all the bickering was going on, Philip stood up and said, But teacher, the tomb was empty. 
That's why I put nothing in my egg. Jesus is no longer there. Friend, that's still the message needed today. The tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. Listen, we know what happens next. He found his disciples and he told them to go and change the world. He gave them the great commission to go and make disciples of all nations. He ascended into heaven in victory to sit at the right hand of the Father. He sent the Holy Spirit to empower us to live new lives in Christ. Can I remind you of something today? Through his death on the cross, the penalty of sin is forever paid. Can I remind you of something else? Through his resurrection from the grave, the power of sin can be broken in our lives every single day. Praise God. Believer, Christian, can I talk to you for just a moment? Do you know this today? I wonder if you need to take some time this morning and praise Jesus for dying for your sins and giving you new life. I wonder if you need to be reminded of the power of the Holy Spirit within you to make you more like Jesus every day. I wonder if you need to be reminded of your mission to make disciples of all nations. Can I tell you something? Jesus is alive. The tomb is empty. That's the victory of the cross that we get to live in every day. Are you living in that victory? Listen, maybe you're here this morning because someone in your family made you come. Thank you, whoever that was in your family that forced you to be here. Maybe you're here because you always go to church on Easter Sunday. Listen, we're certainly glad you chose to worship with us. But friend, what if this Easter is where Jesus is finally wanting to grab a hold of your heart and he wants you to know that his death on the cross, his resurrection from the grave, it's not just a fun story that you can hear about every year. No, no, no. It happened so your sins could be forgiven and he could give you new life. Friend, listen, would you trust in him today? Would you surrender your life to Jesus? Can I just show you something real quick? The Bible is clear. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. You know what that means? That means you. If you look to the person on your right, guess what? It means them. You look to the person on your left, guess what? It means them. Look behind you. Look in front of you. It means us. We are the ones that Jesus came to die for. In fact, here's What we learn from Romans chapter 10, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Listen to this. For with the heart, one believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. You know what the writer of Romans goes on to say in 1013? He says, for whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Once again, friend, that's you. You can confess and believe right where you are today. You can pray and give your life to Jesus. Listen, I'm going to stop talking, I promise, in a few more minutes. Listen, in just a little bit, we're going to leave this place, right? We're going to go eat lunch at some family member's house who, you know, picks, you know, cooks the best food or whatever, whatever that looks like, right? Maybe you're going to hunt some Easter eggs. Maybe the Easter bunny came to your house while we were at church this morning. I don't know what that looks like for you, okay? There's going to be a lot of stuff that happens. But can I remind you of something? Listen, Christians in the room, listen to me real quick. Even though all that stuff will be great and I'm glad you get to do it, I'm glad I get to do it. Can we take just a moment this morning and remember that even though those things are good, none of those compare to why we're here this morning. None of those compare to what Jesus has done for us. So can I just challenge you with something? If you're a follower of Jesus, maybe you've been a Christian for more years than I can count, and you've heard this story more years than I've been alive, maybe today, though, is a great reminder for you to reflect once again on a story that never gets old. Jesus died and rose again so he could cover your sins and mine and give us new life to live the life he desires for us to live. Christian, believer in the room, maybe this morning, It's a great opportunity if you take just a few moments and thank Jesus for what he's done on the cross. Maybe that hasn't happened yet today in all the busyness. Maybe this weekend's been busy. Maybe it's been months since you spent time with Jesus. Hey, can I tell you something? Today would be a great day for you to fall on your face and spend a few moments with the God who died for you. Listen, you can come pray at this altar. You can pray where you are. In just a moment, I'm be in that lobby. You can come find me and say, Danny, I got some things I want you to pray with me about. I would love to pray with you about walking deeper in your relationship with Jesus. But can I, can I leave you with one thought? Maybe you're here this morning and you say, Danny, I'm not a Christian. 
I know there's a lot of people in here. I know Easter may be like a cliche time, you know, give my life to John, it's Easter Sunday, you know, I don't want to make a big deal. Out of, you know, okay, okay. If you're here this morning, you say, Danny, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. Can I tell you something? There is no better day than today to surrender your life to Christ. Maybe you too have heard this story for years and years and years, but maybe today, finally it clicked. Jesus died for me. Friend, can I tell you something? In just a moment, I'm going to be in that lobby. I'd love to take my Bible and tell you how you can begin a relationship with Jesus. But can I tell you something a little bit better? You don't need me. You got everything you need right here. You've heard it this morning. Jesus has given you all you need to begin a relationship with him. You know what you need to do? When we respond in the next few moments, here's what you need to do. You need to forget anybody else in this room for just a moment. And you need to get with you and God. And in prayer, you need to say, Jesus, I am sorry for the sinner that I am. I realize I need you to save me from my sins. Jesus, will you save me? Will you forgive me? Will you be the Lord and Savior of my life? I want to surrender all to you. Listen, that was just my prayer, okay? You can pray however you want to. You don't need me. You don't need anybody else. You know who you need? You need Jesus. And friends, he's made a way for you to be made right with God. He is the perfect mediator. Would you today spend some time with Jesus and give your life to him? Once again, if you need me, I'll be hanging out in that lobby. There'll be other people back there. You may not want to talk to me. I'm kind of, kind of sweaty. I'll get you somebody who's not, all right? That was weird. I apologize. But it was the elephant in the room. I just took care of it. All right, I know it's, I'm sorry. For that. Listen, however you need to respond to Jesus today, I invite you to do so. I'm gonna pray for us. And I'm gonna invite each of you to ask the Lord what he has for you today. Father, we love you. Thank you, Jesus, you're awesome. Thank you so much for our time together in your word today. God, thank you so much for another incredible Easter, an incredible Resurrection Sunday to celebrate what you've done for us. God, I pray that this story never gets old. Father, I pray that for every Christian, every believer in the room this morning, that it never gets old. In fact, right now, God, I pray that you'd grab the heart of every believer, every disciple in the room, and I pray that you would burden each of us to thank you now for what you've done for us on the cross. May we never forget the beauty of Jesus' death for us. God, I pray that we would always remember that you are no longer in the tomb. There is no grave that has your remains because you are alive forevermore. And because you're alive, Jesus, I too can experience new life through you. God, that should make every believer in the room spend numerous moments of praise to you. But God, I know there are people in this room who don't have a relationship with Jesus. God, I know there's people in here right now today who if, who if their life ended right now, they would not spend eternity with you. God, I pray right now that, Father, you convict them. God, I pray right now that you draw them to yourself. I pray right now, God, that you don't let them leave these next few moments without spending time with you and surrendering their life to Jesus. Father, I pray for anyone who needs you today that, God, they would reach out, they would call out, and that, Lord, you are waiting to meet them right where they are. Father, whatever it is you want to do today, God, however it is you want to speak to hearts, whatever it is you're challenging each person in this room with, God, I know it's a familiar story. I know we talk about it every year, but, God, it's that good. It needs to be talked about all the time. God, may we always remember how good Jesus is. So right now, Lord, have your will and have your way in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand and respond together. In Christ alone my hope is found and he is my light, my strength, my soul, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still 
And when striving seeks My comforter My all in all Here in the love of Christ I stand In Christ alone Who took on flesh of God in helpless faith, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, until on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. of the Lord. Amen. Till he returns or calls me home, we can stand in the power of Christ. But before we're dismissed, uh, I want to remind you of a few things. Uh, If you're with us every week, you've heard me say it before. I'll say it again. Everyone has a next step. There's always a next step in your walk with Christ. And we've put together some resources uh, to help you along that journey. Right along that back wall, there's what we call the next step, next steps area. Um, you can take a look there. If you're a guest, we'd love for you to take a look. Um, if you're a member, we'd love for you to take a look. Everybody has a next step. Uh, one thing I want to encourage you in is maybe your next step uh, is giving, worshiping God through giving. Uh, one of our core values is we give so others can gain. Amen. Um, as you may have noticed, we didn't pass a plate this Sunday. That does not mean that we are discouraging you from uh, worshiping through giving. Uh, we encourage you to give. There's some Uh, giving boxes in the lobby. You'll see those along the wall. There's one in the Next Steps area as well. You can also give online um, or through our mobile app. You have those options there. Uh, But we we always want you to remember that we don't give just to contribute financially to some sort of institution. No, we give so others can gain. We give because we want others to know of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Um, And so, so great to be a part of that mission. Amen. Listen, let me pray and we'll be dismissed. God, we love you. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the truth that we get to remember every Easter, every Sunday. 
um, that you came, you died, you rose again, and we have new life. We have eternal life in you. We look forward to uh, seeing you, being with you fully uh, the day that you return. We, we wait longingly, expectingly for your return. God, we, may we be found faithful in our walk, faithful in our journey, faithful in our mission to make disciples. Lord, would you empower us, strengthen us, guide us the rest of this day and the rest of this week. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, church. We'll see you soon.